Why, hello there. Welcome to Smart Aspirations with Justin Huff. Sit back, chill out, and go on a journey around the world. Around the world. Justin will discuss tales of hope, discovery, and general irreverence with some of the most dynamic personalities in the travel business. Remember, we do cool shit, and so can you. Hey, everybody, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Smart Aspirations with Justin Huff. This is a very, very special episode. Today, we're joined by my friend, philanthropist, conservationist, hotelier, globetrotter, and all-around baddest, Mr. Amit Sankala. How's it going, Amit? What's what's cracking today? Good, Justin. How are you doing? I'm very well. Uh, hope uh, I'm excited too. to be here. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. It's uh, Now, I know that you're right now you're based in Vancouver. And from what I see in the background, I, I didn't know there were forests that look like that in Vancouver. It's completely like this in Vancouver. It looks like you've never been here before. <laughs> I got to go, man. <laughs> this, this is technology. So literally, it, it looks like that I'm sitting in Kana National Park in India, which is dominated by salt forests. Sort of the history of where Rudyard Kipling got inspired to write the Jungle Book. Uh, and this salt forest is, you know, if I was there right now, it'd be tigers calling on one side and jackals <laughs> on one side and it'd be a different story. But yes, no, this is a background from Kana National Park in India. Yeah, I, I can imagine Mowgli swinging by on the vines, which would be quite cool. And I've, I, in my uh, Indian wildlife safari experience, I've only been through Ranthambore, which is deciduous forest and looks totally different than that. So it's really cool to see like quite a lot of diversity within the different environments there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, anywhere you go in India, that's the beauty of India. It's got every different kind of landscape that you can go to, from the Himalayas to the desert, uh, to Sundarbans, to mangroves. Right. Uh, and, and, and there is diversity almost everywhere throughout the country, which is what makes it so magical. And also because of that, there, there is an amazing diversity of wildlife that exists in many sure. different types of climates and many different types of forests. And it's all there in India. And I can imagine with your family history, you you are so hardwired with conservation and, and, and just Overall, I mean, you're basically a naturalist, you know, it's just been so ingrained in your brain at a young age. Walk us through a little bit of your family history and, and how you got started in tiger conservation. Sure. Uh, my family history sort of when we dated back to my grandfather, uh, we talked about, you know, in, in, in the 50s, my grandfather used to be the person who used to issue permissions to go shoot tigers. This is right after the British and it was all legal and he was yeah. the person who would give you the permit and you cool. shoot a tiger. And he writes about this in his book for many, many, a whole chapter about it. And he takes the one day, you know, there's chatter around the campfire. And it's like, if you shoot your tiger, you get a promotion in your job. And he worked for the forest department. So one day he decided with his buddies, you know, take a gun and he shot his first tiger. He spent wow. about probably six to seven pages in his book t uh, talking about the guilt he had yeah. after that yeah. experience that he had and that whether the tiger just staring at his eyes while being dead. It was, was this a game or was it what this was? So he decided from that point on that he would spend the rest of his life uh, in conservation rather than what he does. Wow. And this is what brought him in the 60s. He, uh, he did a fellowship, a fellowship called the Jawaharlal Nehru Fellowship, where he, was, uh, he did a census of all of India on how many tigers are left. And at okay. the IUCN conference uh, in, I believe, 1969, he raised the alarm of that the tigers are dying at a very fast pace. And if you don't do something about it right now, they're going to be gone. They will mm -hmm. be extinct. Uh, and we had literally at that point gone to less than 5,000 tigers in the world at that point. Uh, this is, mind you, from 40,000 tigers to in the last century. Uh, all different reasons, of course, the big, uh, the shooting uh, you know, the, the sport, uh, hunting sport was a big thing in the 40s during the British time and then later during the Maharaja times. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, it's a, it's a thing of a pride. Yeah. Uh, by 1971, with the support of great some ministers in the government and especially Indira Gandhi, who was the prime minister at that time, who was a champion, I would say, of the conservation movement for wildlife in India, uh, they, they started something called Project Tiger. And the idea of Project Tiger was to, first time in India, establish national parks through the country where there were tigers in good density mm -hmm. present, and we would protect those habitats. As a government, they would protect that. And they started with the first nine tiger reserves. And this Kana that you see in the background was one of them. 
And these were massive areas of land. But the big challenge at that point, India, as you know, is a country of a billion people today, you know, 1.2 sure. billion roughly, uh, give or take 5, 10%. <laughs> Imagine it's 100 million up or down. Uh, <laughs> even then, you know, tribes and people existed everywhere. The idea of you know, uh, creating safe havens for wildlife was only possible if many, uh, in many cases, villages were moved outside these national parks, which today, if you go to any national park in India, even Ranthambo for that matter, all the open meadows that you see once used to be villages. You know, yeah. there are presents and evidences of wells that still exist there or, or trees that were planted and wouldn't exist from before, stuff like that. So the whole idea of Project Tiger was to create these habitats of tiger. And then in that tiger is just a poster boy. You know, you yeah. protect the tiger, you protect everything around it. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, been, that's been quite a successful thing that today it's about 50 tiger reserves. My father, when after my grandfather passed, not before my grandfather passed, my father got into tourism business in the early 80s, focusing primarily on the issues of conservation and tourism, how they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And they would go to deep forests of central India back in the 80s when it was really an expedition to get there. You know, sure. one hours on a train, then a three hour drive. So Marathon. Really, yeah, you really made an effort to get there. Uh, and then in the late 80s, he established uh, wildlife camps uh, in central India at that point. Mm -hmm. And today, you know, fathers no more, grandfathers no more died a long time ago. Uh, the idea is that these national parks around the country have become popular and famous. Uh, and, and there are many people visiting it. And I, I truly believe that tourism today is a big part of conservation in India. The only reason mm -hmm. the tigers are surviving today is because we can see them. Not the only reason, of course, the forest department is doing amazing work, but in hand in hand uh, for sort of anti-poaching units or just reporting on the social media power, you know, yeah. is why we have tigers today. So this is sort of what I do now. Well, that's- I didn't, I didn't expect to go on for so long then. No, I mean, it's it's a fascinating history that has to be explored to understand, you know, what was built, generate, you know, two generations ago to what it is now. And, and you had mentioned something that, um, that stuck out really quickly with me was that the tiger is the poster boy uh, of wildlife in India. And there's really so much more that people don't even realize. What is a wildlife safari like in India? It's, it's, uh, it's very different to Africa. So the first thing that comes to people's mind when they think about safari in the world yeah. is Africa. I love Africa. Literally. I've been there. Well, the beast migration. Yes. Yeah. The migration and Botswana and everything pops up. Yeah. Now, in a country like India, where the diversity is is from every terrain, so we, we can talk about the Himalayas, we can talk about the desert, we can talk about mangroves, we can talk about rainforest. Uh, in every different part of the country, there's it's teeming with wildlife almost everywhere. Totally. And the beauty is that we have saved almost a, a lot of our species along with 1.2 billion people living in it. So, <laughs> That's insane. So think in think about the math really quick there. Yeah. <laughs> And, and remember, I keep saying Africa, Africa, Africa. Africa is a continent. India is a country. Let me clarify right. that. You know, when we're actually comparing that stat, people need to say that when they talk about big five, big five, big five, well, let me just do the big five here. Tigers, Asiatic lions, snow leopards, wild elephants, wild buffaloes. I'm not even getting into leopards, clouded leopards. Which are there. So, yeah. yeah, which are very much there. Uh, you know, we can get into you know, red pandas, we can get into different kinds of bears, we can get into jackals, wild dogs, striped hyenas. I want to see a sloth bear. Yeah. That's my yeah. bucket list right now. Yeah, Dakana is a great place for it too. As well. You know, <laughs> their necessities, necessities song came out of there. Yes. Uh, but, but, but anyway, you go, I mean, tigers are present in well over 50 tiger reserves in the country, which means throughout the country, except Gujarat and, and in the north, uh, you know, closer to the Himalayas, tigers are found everywhere. But now they're even finding tigers in Bhutan at higher and higher elevations, um, which means, you know what, you give them a place to survive, they will. They, they will. are very adaptable. We've seen today, unfortunately, uh, you know, Caspian tiger is gone, Java tiger is gone, Indo-Chinese tiger, and South China tiger may be in captivity in, in very few numbers. But having said that, the only things that are left are Bengal tiger, Sumatran tiger, and Siberian tiger. These are the only three really species that remain in the wild today. And when we look at tigers, they are all different terrains they exist in, in the snow in Siberian tigers. Uh, or, or in, in uh, the rainforests of India. So tigers are very adaptable, you yeah. know, where you find them today. And 
And that's why a safari in India is you still go on your four by four Jeeps, but unlike open savanna lands that you have in Africa, where you can take big Land Rovers and go anywhere you like, these are a little bit more dense jungles. And yeah, it, it, you got to work for it. Yeah, and there is no sort of radios that you radio other people to just come to a different, you know, a particular location. <laughs> it is really the old school way of trucking a tiger, you know. We, we're trying to listen to alarm calls. We're trying to listen to uh, the, the pug marks, uh, where the tiger was, what's tigress's uh, area that we know. We're trying to smell the scent marks on the trees. It is literally involving all that to track a tiger, which drives your adrenaline. Totally. It's it's, uh, the, the, my know. first tiger safari was so adrenaline inducing. And it, it, the whole thing is an adventure and it's a story. And it's not like you, you can go out there all day long in search of your in search of wildlife you're going to see so many beautiful surroundings and everything but you can see the guides so work this stuff and it's it's part of the story every day is a different story and it's incredible um and i mean sp and speaking of guides and people and communities what what are some of the things that your um your camps and lodges have done for local sustainability efforts in the areas where you operate yeah, I mean, 90, 95% of the people that we employ are local. They come from sort of local uh, villages. They have moved up in ranks. Some have become naturalists. Some have become, you know, assistant managers. Some have become chefs over mm -hmm. time. You know, uh, the latest camp that we set up was uh, Jamtara Wilderness, which is about six and a half years ago now. And the whole idea was we, I, I grew up in an era in the 80s where, uh, you know, we would just go up to the dense jungles there. We stay in a forest rest house or we had made our first lodge in 1989 in Bandhavgarh, and the elephants would just come up with the mahout, and they would just say, Saheb, let's go, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I was a little kid, you know? <laughs> you know, I bring my, a school friend or two to impress them. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you be brushing your teeth, and you hop on the elephant, and you finish your nap, <laughs> finish your nap on it, you know? Yeah. And then you just head out for three, four hours. There's no gate or lineup or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or, or lock or anything. It was the jungle. You Pick know? up your friends on your elephant. That's a little bit better than like a Chevy Blazer, which is what I had. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the beauty of that, the romance of that, let's put it that way, is just being in that misty morning and, and just sure. being an elephant, nobody else, and you have amazing tiger sightings, the elephant drops you back to your room. Now, how That's cool is that? You know, it's, it's that, that experience uh, that I cherish so much over time. Uh, and, and elephants in India, I mean, before we get on to, you know, uh, the PETA issues regarding elephants, these elephants primarily are cent in central India and all of India. A lot of the elephants are used for anti-page poaching units. Mm -hmm. uh, today, you, can, you cannot just get on the elephants, especially in central India, uh, other than sort of paying a lot of money for exclusivity yeah. sake. But generally, they are monitoring the jungles left, right and center every day. Uh, mm -hmm. in areas where you can't go to as humans can't just walk into dense jungles. That's where you head on in the elephants. With the elephants. Uh, I actually, did, I had no idea that elephants were used with anti-poaching units. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah, just just in, I would say, central India alone, there would be about 35 elephants, anti-patrolling, uh, you know, okay. uh, anti-poaching elephants that are out there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, too, also for day-to-day -day issues, remember in, in majority of India, when wildlife exists, our national parks are not fenced. You know, yeah. This, this side is the jungle, that side is the village, and there's a few rocks in the middle to tell you that that's that side. But it's sure. not stopping, you know, the wildlife from going out, but it's just trying to tell people that you can't go in. Correct. You know, there's no commercial. So in the cases of a tiger moves into a village, you know, and suddenly tries to decide that it wants to go in the house of so-and-so and just hang out. Yeah. When, what do you do? That's when you call the elephants you know, to drive the tiger. Uh, okay. Uh, that's, that's, that's the whole idea because it's, you know, it's uh, a little dangerous to just head on with the stick to, towards the tiger. Uh, hence, depending on whatever the situation of the tiger is, maybe a mother who's scared, maybe it's a big male tiger, uh, just gotten off route, why yeah. in the village. In order to do that, we have to first drive the tiger out of there. So for yeah. the safety of the people, and that's when the elephants are called as well. Elephants are, play a very critical role in this, you know, fight for conservation that we have here. That's um, cool, man. I had no idea. That's fascinating. <laughs> so coming back to my lodge and camp on how I set it up, I wanted to go back to that era. You know, yeah. I said I lived this, you know, 25 years ago now uh, that I want to sort of go back and, and live uh, some of it if I can. And I wanted to, I started looking for places where it's still a popular national park, all right, because you still have to run a sustainable tourism business. But sure. go to an area where there's nobody else. Yeah, and, exactly. 
when we made Jamtara, you know, it, it required you to go from an airport an extra additional hour to get to us. But the thing is, when you got to us, there was no other lodge in the nearby area. You almost had exclusive access to a park gate, but you were going in the same park as everybody. So you're still seeing tigers almost on a daily or bi-daily basis, uh, you know, and, uh, and teeming with wildlife even around. So even the, the camera traps that we have just a couple of weeks ago caught mother and three cubs walking by our dining hall at 2 a.m. You know, leopards come on a weekly basis because yeah. you, what is the new thing? We need to rewild. You know, we need to get back into this rewilding phase. Uh, and that's that's where Jamtara came in, that we would involve the local community in everything that we do. We would set up beds on their lands as well. So we contribute them revenue. We did this model called Star Beds. And, and everybody that we hire would be eventually local in three years because you train over time. Okay. And yeah. you get to that point. You know, and, and, but anything that we do in the camp or the lodge, we will never cut a tree on what we do. And, and whatever we, we are only open six, seven months of the year in India, mm -hmm. rest of the time is rainy season, we would completely vanish for the rest five months. And we will not make a, a mobile camp. But I, for example, I went to the graveyard of Asia to buy uh, a graveyard of ships of Asia. So, you know, all these ships come to get destroyed here in a place in Gujarat. And you go there at any given time, there's like 20, 30 big ships parked from cruise liners <laughs> to cargo liners. <laughs> and and, 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 and I, <laughs> it's, it's fascinating to be there. And I bought 20 tons of wood from the flooring of ships because oh the wood has been in the water for 25 years and nothing happens to it. It's treated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we bought 20 tons of wood. We did all our flooring from it. Then I went to the American embassy in Delhi was getting rid of their art deco furniture from the 70s. <laughs> so we bought all the old furniture to put in all the rooms. I went to at the Supreme Court of India was getting rid of those big judge tables, the green Rexane ones. So we bought 12 of those. We, oh. we, uh, so everything that we sort of brought into the camp, we, we procured old doors from schools in central India, which are light blue in color. And we did our flooring for our dining hall in it. Um, so, you know, things like that, where a lot of these, all the tents, the flooring would come out, yeah. the furniture would pack in, the tent would come down. And starting May, all the way till September, we would just, leopards would take over, wildlife <laughs> would take over, spiders would be everywhere. The jungle <laughs> would come back. Right. The idea of true sustainability where you are really, the impact of land that you're causing is very minimal, uh, especially for the days it is there. So, you know, those were concepts that we wanted to bring in. We did. And I would imagine that the local community where you're operating in Jamtara, that, that kind of concession model where you've got that direct revenue sharing agreement, people are really going to be custodians of that land for future generations and take a lot of pride in it. Yeah, so we, we're trying to work on a conservation sort of community land purpose. It takes a long time because it's not been done in India before. It's mm -hmm. something completely new. And they the the, the first thing, some of it, land is everything, you know, yeah. to, to a farmer at yep. the end of the day. The moment you say you're going to do something to the land, they, their ears stand up. It's like, what are you going to do to my farm? And right. to explain them that this revenue sharing model can work is, is, um, is something that will take years to explain. Sure. And I think we are, we are much further down the line than we were five years ago. And mm -hmm. we started small in different areas and we've already seen so much wildlife come back. Now, if you show an image of the star bed at some point, what I'll try to well. explain is that uh, a farmer has slept out protecting their crops for thousands of years, hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, wildlife passes their crops, you know, they're shooing away wildlife at night, they're shouting at it, throwing things, and then wildlife goes away and the farmer sleeps again. You know, so they make these little machans on the head. We said, listen, we want to see this wildlife that you're chasing away. We want to see that wild dog pack that just went by or uh, deers that are going by or even wild boars that are going by. And yeah. we created a star bed, uh, you know, a luxury version of what they have and said, we are going to pay you money for every time we sleep out there. So you sort of have a mini hotel here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we're going to pay you money not to chase away what, that wildlife. <laughs> and what, what the aim is that if we can get to multiple star beds and if we can rewild this land, we can unite the corridor. Completely. You know, and, and, and the wildlife. And eventually, hopefully, the farmer can stop farming. We can right. guarantee an income uh, saying there's enough money out there to preserve land today. And I said, I don't want to just give money to these people. I want to give them a job other than farming. So the sure. thing, moment they're sitting at home, they're drinking, beating their wives. You don't want that. You know, yeah. you don't want to be the cause to that. <laughs> no, 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 God, no. So, God, no. 
So the idea is, you know, honeybee farming or anything okay. that we, we can bring into the area with different organizations. So we're doing a study right now of um, these people coming in from a vocational college uh, saying what other job opportunities can be created for yeah. these 25, 30 families and a much bigger land can reunite. And many of them will hire as uh, guards to protect okay. The okay. for that matter and bring make water holes on it. Uh, at the end of the day. So we're hoping that we can get through to that. Well, there's so much going on. And I mean, other than, you know, game drives and, and wildlife experiences, can guests do have any kind of community experiences when they're staying at Jamtara? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, since these people have not seen much outsiders at the end of the day, that's why we went to a remote region that the only people that they see as foreigners are the 10 rooms that we have. Sure. You know, that, that walk into the village and, and we encourage that rather than always sort of having a guided walk, just yeah. make your way out there. You know, yeah. and, and I, we'll absolutely send somebody as well. That's not an issue. And the villagers themselves will invite you for a chai in their house. That's it is amazing. that authentic and that automatic that they feel like, oh, can I get a picture with you and I'll give you chai in return, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know? And, and they're excited about that. Go to the local school, uh, you know, and they will welcome you and all the ch children will surround you. And, and uh, you know, it, it's just a magical, untouched experience. Sure. But it's not a commercialized venture. Yeah, it's not manufactured. It's not manufactured. I mean, cultural tourism, as you well know, you know, in your globe trotting career, I mean, it can be so contrived. And it's right. honestly, it's, you know, your, your kind of solar plexus sets off this kind of sense of right and wrong. It's like, this is not cool at all. But I mean, that is completely yeah. amazing. Yeah, just just to have authenticity. You know, it's like, the most magical moment of Jamtara is when 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 the livestock, the, the cows are coming home, the sun is setting right, in the right. background is a forest yeah. and, and it's just somebody's smoking their hookah and there's yeah. smoke coming out of it. And it's just the, the moment, you know, yeah. it's like this is magical right here. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Well, I mean, there's so much we could expand on in this, but I, I also want to focus on another part of India that gets a lot of coverage. And, and you know, and you see these incredible, colorful festivals all throughout the country. And is that something that, um, I, I don't even want to phrase it that way, is, is, or I mean, tell me a little bit about some of the more, what's the word, niche, um, kind of sell, like unknown, really interesting, fascinating cultural festivals that guests can experience in India. No, absolutely. I mean, there's, India is a land for festivals. I mean, every every few weeks there is a festival somewhere or the other <laughs> in India. Uh, almost, I would say, almost every day it's auspicious for something or the other. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, ones, the ones that I focused on, you know, primarily in the last couple of years is one of them is the Kummela. You know, I, I love uh, going to the Kumme. I think the first kum I went to was about 15 years ago. Yeah. And the whole idea of kum is, you know, if I was to dumb it down, I would say the good gods and the bad gods were fighting. And they were <laughs> fighting, they were churning the ocean. And they were churning the ocean for all these magical things to come out. Yeah. You know, uh, you know beautiful ladies came out. Uh, the Kamdhenu cow who gives ghee and butter to our people came okay. out. And one of the things that was going to come out was Amrit which is if you drank that, you would become immortal. Amaranth. Uh, yeah, Amrit. So okay. it, uh, it, it's, it's the nectar of immortality, the pot cool. of nectar. So, and and um, while one of the gods was running away with this nectar, they say that the whole process lasted 12 days. And yeah. in 12 days, the nectar, there are many versions of it, dripped in four places on earth, or the nectar was put down in these four places on earth, you know, whatever this story is, but in one God year, uh, one God day is equal to one human year. Okay. So 12 days became 12 years. Makes sense. They say that in these four places, if you take a dip in the Ganges, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, it will make you cleanse your sentence. Right. That way. And believing that faith, millions and millions of people come to visit the Kum. The last Kum saw about 100 million people in about two and a half months. Oh my uh, God. So the magnitude of people, like on the auspicious days, I still remember being there on auspicious days. Uh, there's about 10 million people on that particular day taking a dip in the Ganges. I mean, the sea of people that you see left and right, and you're in this boat, and everywhere there's people. 
And people wow. ask me, I met so many people, so many crowds, you still like to go to it? I said, absolutely. I mean, if you're not that photographer who's looking for that, you know, Nat Geo shot for sure. the 10 million people, all the other days are this amazing one-to-one -one interaction, which is just fascinating. Uh, there's, there's an image here where we are sitting with about three different sadhus in a tent and uh, <laughs> meditation is going on in the evening. I have about five clients with me. And, uh, you know, once everything stops, you know, three of the sadhus on the right start speaking to us and they speak perfect English. And they're like, yeah, I was a lawyer in London. You know, <laughs> I, I, I gave up everything. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's naked. The only thing he's wearing is a saffron robe. and he's got Tell the listeners what a sadhu is. Uh, Sadhu is, is a spiritual uh, human being who's devoted everything uh, to God or spirituality and has yeah. given up earthly belongings, you right. know. So this person doesn't have anywhere to stay. He says he lives under, under a tree. Mm -hmm. He says it's been eight years. Uh, and it's amazing that these people have had it all, you yeah. know. They probably went to, you know, good background, everything. Indian guy who moved to abroad and then came back. And uh, now it's, um, yeah, it's been eight years. And I said, what do you, what food do you survive on? He's like, the people from the local village give me Russian, you know, give me some rice and lentils yeah. and whatever. And uh, we cook and we, we meditate and this is what we do and all that. And he went on to smoke his ganja and carry on. But right, what a cool subculture, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, the two hour conversation we, ha we had with this person was amazing because this is a conversation with somebody who has had it all, flown business class around the world, blah, 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 yeah, yeah. and done that you know and, yeah. and been there done that now lives under a tree has no real home you know <laughs> and is more content than he was he you know, ever was eight eight years ago <laughs> so you know it's it's very interesting what people give up their lives they become buddhist monks they become mm -hmm. sadhus they become you know many things and just that interaction with many such people in a place yeah. like the kumela is quite exciting because people come from all walks of life uh and just seeing and hearing stories culturally of people and why if some of the uh, why some tradition exists compared to the others why this akara which is like a club of sadhus is superior than the other uh you know many stories sort of we can get into but but being in the taking sort of that i, I won't really recommend the dip in the ganges so much you know i don't know <laughs> Polluted, polluted. I'll take the word for it, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but just being the experience is just, and and, and you can have completely uh, exclusive sort of an experience, which is spiritual leader uh, with you in those two, three days that I promise you is the definition of transformational travel. Wow. You know, it's, it, it will change you, uh, <laughs> you know, in ways you can't imagine. Well, you two questions. Do, how long does the whole thing last and where can you, where can you see it throughout India? Uh, it happens in four different places in India, which is Haridwar, Allahabad, Ujjain, oh, and Nasik. The, these are the four different places. I'm sorry, say, say that again. I interrupted you. Haridwar, uh, Allahabad. Allahabad. Uh, now, and now it's called, they changed the name, Prayagraj. Don't ask. In India, they keep changing names of cities. Prayagraj, <laughs> uh, Nasik, and Ujjain. These okay. four places are auspicious, they say, where the nectar fell. But... I would only recommend that you go to the ones in Haridwar and Allahabad because they happen in the winter months. They usually start around January 12th to 14th and they go all the way till, you know, end of March, some of them into early April as well. Yeah. Uh, and the ones in the summer, you know, you can imagine that in India, the heat can get up to 120 Fahrenheit. Yeah. You don't want to do that. No, no, no. no, no. Uh, the winter ones are, are amazing. The next big one, well, there's one happening now. Of course, it's been scaled down to a level where it's you have to have a COVID, you know, negative test and all that. Sure. Which people have never heard of this concept. Uh, but the next good one to go to would be 2025. Okay, and, 2025. And, put it on your calendar. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would say don't don't just do it. I mean, of course, you can do it alone as, as uh, you know, husband and wife. But I would say be a part of a little bit of a community. You know, sure. five, six people, eight people that you maybe know each other or maybe you lead a group, Justin, who knows, you know, but, but the, to have that experience and who do you share it with? Right. You know, because you want to share the experience you're having and, and while you're there. Absolutely. That's, yeah. that's, that's what makes it so powerful that while you're there, you, this, this something triggers in your mind to start thinking in a very different way. Yeah. And when you do that, those conversations in the evening, you know, mm -hmm. once you've had the experience, is very essential. Yeah. You know, 
completely. To get it out of your system to talk about life, death, spirituality, whatever, you know? And that's Or just giving up your, your work life and becoming a sadhu. You know? <laughs> yes. Yes. Somebody talking you out of it. It's like, don't do this. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the festivals I love. It doesn't come every year. The 12th cycle comes every 12 years in these four different places, but the Hindu calendar looks at it very differently. So in these places, every six years, they say the Ardh Kum, which means half Kum, and 12 years means the Poon Kum, which means the full Kum. Okay. That's neat. It's very complicated. Wikipedia it if you like, but 2025 is the next big one, just for your understanding's sake. Um, I'm going. <laughs> other festival I like is the Hornbill Festival, which I go to in Nagaland. Nagaland, uh, yeah. Complete northeast of India. Uh, well, 12 to 13 different remote tribes to come together. Uh, to be fairly honest, I, I don't think it's a very authentic festival in the sense of that it's been happening for hundreds of years. No, it was put up together by the government about 15, 20 years ago, uh, yeah. you know, sort of to bring all the tribes together. It was tourism was a part of it, but it was never the essential element of it. The idea yeah. was that these uh, they, the dialogue between these tribes need to happen mm -hmm. at the end of the day. I mean, one of the tribes uh, was called the headhunter tribes because they would have revenge and kill yeah. the other person and hang the head in, in front of the village, you know, up till 1980s. You know, so we're not even talking long back. And right. just all these people, these tribes come together. And for them, it now becomes this big get together of, of, of and they wear the authentic gear, which they've, you know, which their tribe celebrates. Well, uh, I, I'm not going to quote you on this, but how many tribes more or less are in that seven sisters, Northeast India area? All those states. There would be a lot. Yeah. I would have to look that up, Justin. No, no, no. I mean, I'm not, no, I mean, I'm just thinking, like, you know, for for viewers thinking about, like, you know, four tribes. No, this is like, you know, definitely like over thirty or something like that. Let, I mean, let, let me give you an interesting stat. We are a country of 1.2 billion people. Mm -hmm. uh, we speak well over 300 languages. Yeah. We have well over 2,000 dialects. Uh, we have 18 official languages, which means that government papers are written in that main languages. So oh it means God. that every 50, 60 kilometers of India, your, your language changes. Yeah. There are four metropolitan cities in India, the big ones, you know, Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, and Mumbai. Together, they have about 80 to 90 million people. Can you believe it that all those four cities speak four completely different languages? Yeah. You know, in a, in a country called India. You know, it, yeah. it's like if I was to pick up the phone and call Chennai uh, back in the day called Madras, you know, speaks completely different language. I have to speak English. There is right. no way of getting around. You know, <laughs> Calcutta, I might get wrong, get around with Hindi a little bit, but they speak Bengali. So yeah, they speak, speak English. And same thing with Mumbai. Mumbai sort of is more international, so they get a lot of the other languages. They get Hindi because right. of Bollywood influence and all that. Uh, but English is what they would prefer to speak because a lot of them speak Marathi otherwise. Marathi, yeah. 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 So that, that, let that sink in. <laughs> That's a good way to put it into perspective. You're right. But um, yeah, but you, you also sent me this incredible video with the Nagaland um, Hornbill Festival. I'd love to play that. Could you tell us what's going on there? Yeah. So, you know, this is one of the tribes. Uh, this is in a way uh, them representing strength from their tribe to the other tribe. So they're pulling this rock, this rock, yeah. which weighs you know, tons. Uh, and they, they make a human chain and yeah. tied tie by vines of trees. And they are chanting Om as they go. Okay. Okay. Pulling the rock to a particular point that they have to carry. Usually it goes about two to two and a half kilometers. And they pull that whole rock with the strength of the entire tribe. And oh it's God. just fascinating to just be there and just have that moment of, you know, uh, the, just the chanting of Om with thousands of people at the right. same time in the valley is just right. magical. And, and what are the accommodations like when you do this? Uh, you know, they're fairly good. There is a, the ultimate traveling camp, which is up there, you know, mm -hmm. which is which is really nice, luxurious. Uh, you know, they only have about, you know, anywhere from 12 to 14 tents that go up, particularly for the festival. This happens in the first week of December. Uh, right. So it lasts from 1st to 10th December mm -hmm. uh, around that time. And it's then amazing. after that point on, you know, if, if the ultimate traveling camp doesn't decide to go, you're down to a four-star accommodation level. 
Uh, yeah. and, and that's where our team sort of goes in and takes your bed sheets and towels and soaps and you know sure. our team plugs that into that hotel for that right. stay because to have some of the most incredible play experiences you have to go to remote areas sure. and that's that's the you know sort of trade off here and is uh, you know 12 to 14 rooms i mean that's a tense that's like i mean I, I would assume that that sells out well in advance for for an experience like this a sought after experience like this yes it, Remember, foreigners are still, you know, not very familiar with this festival. So it's not like, and, and Nagaland being in such a corner in northeast of India, it doesn't follow yeah. any route. So I wouldn't say it's very popular. Okay. Uh, it's more popular with, of course, the Indians that go there for photography and to experience that. But the thing with Indian travelers is they don't book till last minute, one month uh, before stuff, okay. you know. Uh, that's why if you are in there six months before planning a journey to India, it's possible. And the best thing to club that with is uh, Kaziranga. Kaziranga is also in the Northeast, five, six hours drive from there. Right. And you can be with the one horn rhinos uh, in the Northeast of the country, which is an amazing story up there in itself. Right. Absolutely. Yes. I totally had forgotten about that. And, and yeah, that whole area is very, very beautiful, very off the beaten path, different food, different culture. And I mean, it's just an, oh, and, and speaking of different food and different culture, you had mentioned you went to Gujarat to procure some, you know, the wood for the building of um, your the yeah. floors of Jantara. Yeah. There isn't, there's a, I believe there's like um, this, this extremely cool cultural experiences that you can, you can have there um, with the people in Gujarat, the more remote you go. Yeah, I, I still think Gujarat is very untapped still. Uh, yeah. It's still very, you know, it's still the right time to go to Gujarat. Uh, of course, you know, there's a trade-off there. Accommodations are basic because you go to remote areas, there's no demand for it. Uh, but if you actually leave the big cities of Ahmedabad and move into the run of Kutch, which is sort of salt plains like Bolivia, you know, okay. salt plains, yeah. uh, the nomadic tribes that exist in those particular areas are just beautiful. And they have not seen many foreigners. Uh, they've seen, of course, Indians that pass through there. Uh, but beyond that, there are areas that you can go to and they migrate based on, uh, you know, how much work they get, how much rain has come. You know, right. they're all dependent on their livestock, depending on what type of traders are there. So I visited recently some camel traders, for example. Okay. You know, they, a small family of, I say about 15, 20 people, there were three, four families together. They had about a hundred camels, uh, you cool. know, and they, they survived by selling camel milk. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, believe it or not, but camels are, camel milk is supposed to be uh, very good for many different types of cancers, uh, you know, so people import it as well. And it's a, it's a very big thing. Uh, so it was interesting just waking up with them one morning at, you know, 5 a.m. I arrived with four or five clients of mine again. And uh, just seeing their, you know, day-to-day -day lives. And right. they were shy, but not shy. You know, there was, there was a two different aspect of it. They were too shy to come and stand and get a picture with us in the sense of they wanted the picture, not so much us. We uh, wanted yes, us to be yes. experience. Um, but, but they were happy people, always smiling, sort That's of cool. like the right attitude. And Gujarat is also the hub for embroidery. Okay. So embroidery from this, there goes around the world to the best, of the best from Yves Saint Laurent to you name it, the big designers are getting it from Gujarat. And there are cultural centers that have been set up by the government and also private people, which have become a hub where these people can come and get fair wages, get employed uh, uh, and provide and work from home you know, get the embroidery okay. work done and sell into the collective, which then sells further. And sells it out, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's been quite well established, but I still think for tourism, it's still very, very, you know, it's not a long way to go. Uh, accommodations can be done in two ways. One, you sort of take a luxury camp in the way, you, a traveling camp, you plant it there for two, three days, have experiences and move on from there. And the other is to stay in accommodations, which are, you know, sort of three, four star, it's not bad, but you yeah. take in all the amenities and make the experience more rich uh, while you're there. Uh, but the authenticity is the right, the type of people and the relationships that you form with them. I have a, I have a guy, she's been, she's Gujarati, she's from there. And we've developed these relationships over time uh, with the communities that it's not a one-time thing anymore for us. You know, there are two or three different tribes when I've told her that anytime they need money for anything, don't give them money. You know, tell me what we can do to make their lives better, whether they want sort of medical insurance in a way, whether they're, they're you know, Cow, camels need something or the buffaloes need something for or the rain has been bad you know so the, make these contributions throughout the year so that we, when we go to them 
you know, uh, it doesn't feel like we are outsiders at this yeah, point. Yeah, we, yeah. We want to be family. We want to eat with them. We want to be with them. That's why we're there to experience that. Yeah, it's, uh, a, it's a genuine investment in 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 their in, in their livelihood and in, in their community and everything. And it's not just something that you're buying with money, like you said, which is you know that's people read right through that. You know, all yeah, around. and we don't we don't want to make it like that. We don't want to make it commercial tourism at the end of the day. I mean, we've seen this in parts of Rajasthan and other parts in India as well. You know, you don't want to go there and give them money and take a photograph with them. I mean, that, yeah, yeah, that, that stuff is let's reserve it. and let's not spoil this. Let's take this in a different route where we form a relationship and mm-hmm. and and slowly you know develop that relationship over time. But that's that's the idea of doing this. Uh, that uh, o- o- always have respect for the communities that we go into. Yeah, and that's exactly how it should be, man. Um, one last thing before we before we close, we're sort of running out of time here, unfortunately. But um, you mentioned authenticity, and I, I have a silly question. Please, how is camel milk? <laughs> <laughs> Absolute crap. <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to have it. You're gonna have the runs for a while. Oh, I'd imagine, man. I had um, I, I was kind of you were telling me about that the other day, and I recall having goat milk um in the Ngorongoro Conservation Area, and it was not one of these song and dance mass tourism places. This was very, very off the beaten path where our our operators there had a really, really good relationship with the local community, and um. The only thing I can recall is that it uh, tastes like it smells. That's about it. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you like yak milk or like uh, camel milk. They're all in the same boat, all of those things. <laughs> Haven't had yak milk yet. I like yak meat, which I had in Bhutan and Chinese Tibet. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll, I might stay away from the milk. So, <laughs> well, listen, man, I want to thank you um, from the bottom of my heart for joining us today. This has been awesome. I hope people get, you know, inspired and, and, and just really, really want to do this once the shroud is fully lifted and gone and the world opens up again. Um, so if you, if you enjoyed this, we're going to put the link below uh, to contact us to plan a bespoke trip to India for you. If you like the video, please, please give us a like. We'd love to hear from you in the comment section. And of course, give us a subscribe as well. That really helps spread the word about the amazing stuff that Ahmed is doing in India and, and throughout the world. So thank you, man, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Pleasure being here, Justin. Take care, my friend. You too. Thank you for listening to Smart Aspirations. Justin Huff is the manager of Swaggy Swan Travel. For all travel-related inquiries, please visit www.swaggyswan.com. That's www.swaggyswan.com. And click Inquiries. Have a stupendous day. And we'll see you next week.